Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, just uh, beautiful sunshine. And Lord, we thank you for all the moms out there, just their faithfulness in raising their children. And uh, Lord, just bless them. We thank you that you've given them this gorgeous day. And Lord, we pray this morning as we come together to worship you, that Father, our hearts and minds would be focused upon you. And as we finish up the book of Ruth, as we see these lessons that you're always at work, that you're, you never stop. And even though we think things are a mess, you know exactly what's going on. And we thank you for that. And just help us to understand that. And just, again, draw us close to you. Yes. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be looking at uh, Psalm 45 this morning. So uh, if you want to join along with me as I read that portion, uh, please turn there. My heart is overflowing with a good matter. I speak of things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured unto thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, almighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thy ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall a king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughters is all glories. Within her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy father shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. Amen. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4 as we continue our study here, our in-depth study in the book of Ruth. And this morning we're going to finish up our study. We've spent the last several months dealing with the events in here, and we saw that this book opens up with three deaths. And again, that's kind of not really an encouraging statement, but that's just where it started. It's not where it ended. If that's where it ended, it would not be an encouraging book. And it's a story of a man named Elimelech and his family. They were living in Bethlehem and Judah, the house of bread. The time period was the time of judges. And during that time, the nation was not doing very well. They had forsaken the Lord over and over again. And what the Lord did was, as they had turned their backs on the Lord, he would bring the enemy in, and the enemy would put them in bondage. And after a period of time, sometimes it took them 18 years to get right with God. They would cry out to God, and God would raise up a judge and deliver them from the hands of the enemy. And they did well while the judge was alive, but as soon as the judge died... They were back in their own ways, and then, again, they were put in bondage at the hands of their enemy. And this happened over and over again. 
Now, in our story, in Bethlehem, we're told that there was a famine. And it was bad enough for Elimelech to take his family and move them out of the house of bread to Moab, outside the promised land, to basically a wash pot. He thought his help would come from the world, and he found out the world couldn't help him. Now, keep in mind, you know, there wasn't a mass exodus from Bethlehem during this famine. All we're told is that Elimelech and his family decided, hey, look, things are tough here. We're moving out of the house of bread, and we're going to Moab. We're going to the world for help. Now, we don't know how long after they were down there in Moab, but Elimelech dies. So his wife, Naomi, is left with her two sons, Malin and Chilid. And because they were down in Moab in the world, they married Moabite women. Chilin married Orpah, and Malin married Ruth. Now, again, we don't know how long after they were married, but both Malin and Chilin die. And now here's my own Naomi. She's living in Moab with her two daughters-in-law with no means of support for them or herself. And this short stay down in Moab while there was this famine in Bethlehem lasted 10 years. And then Naomi hears that God is blessing his people in Bethlehem. So she wants to return home again. Now, maybe because they were Moabite women and the children of Israel were not to marry Gentiles, Naomi tries to discourage her daughter-in-laws from coming. We don't know if that's the only reason, but it's possible. And she tries to drive that point home. Don't follow me back to Bethlehem by telling them, look, God has placed a target on my back, and he's doing target practice, and you don't want to get caught up in it. If you follow me, you're going to get hit. So don't follow me. And Orpah listened to Naomi, and she returned to Moab. But Ruth refused to return. She was going to go with Naomi to Bethlehem. And I believe that Ruth is saved at this point. She wants to go where the God of Israel was at. In Ruth 1, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it said, Ruth said to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. So Naomi takes Ruth with her. They head to Bethlehem, a place that Ruth has never been before. She knows no one there except her mother-in-law, Naomi. And she's willing to go for one reason, because that's where God is. That's where God's people were at. That's truly faith. And it wasn't an easy journey. The distance from Moab to Bethlehem was some 50 miles. The road was difficult and dangerous, especially for women. And, you know, for me and my wife, I wouldn't let her drive alone to visit her mom down in Oklahoma or in uh, um, Missouri. Why? Because it's a dangerous road. There's dangerous people out there. I don't want her traveling alone. If something happens, she's out there by herself. But here are these two women now traveling. But God was with them, right? And nothing was going to stop them from reaching their destination. And again, a tough journey, not just from robbers and other people, but the descent from Moab to the Jordan River was 4,500 feet. And then from the Jordan River to Bethlehem was an ascent of 37, or 3,750 feet. But again, God watched over them. They make it to Bethlehem. They enter the city. And amazing, they've been gone, she's been gone for 10 years, Naomi. And she looked pretty different because of all the years of rebellion against God. And yet the women recognize her. She was angry at God and it took its, its toll on her life, but the women are like, is that you, Naomi? They think that's who it is, but they're not positive, so they ask her. And Naomi means pleasant. Is that you, pleasant? And she says, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Call me bitter because God has been hard upon me. Wow. She's blaming God for everything that's happened upon her life here. And our God is so gracious. Our God is so merciful that even though Naomi kind of gave up on God, God didn't give up on Naomi. 
And if any of you think that God has given up on you, he hasn't. I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you've done. God does not give up on people. And we see that here with Naomi. So they get settled in. Naomi tells Ruth, look, my husband has a near kinsman. And Ruth thinks, well, okay, I'm going to go in his field. I'm going to go glean some of the wheat. Because, again, they had no means to support themselves. And this was a provision that God had made. That if you owned a land and you went in, you, you would glean your field. You go through it once. And whatever was left over was left for the poor, the widowed. They would go through and be able to gather what was left to provide for themselves. And Boaz, who was the owner of the field, he was a near kinsman, he sees Ruth. And he's fallen in love with her. And we see in this story really the hand of God working in the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. And then Naomi gets wind of all that Boaz has done for Ruth. She understands the intentions of Boaz, that he wants to marry Ruth. And she tells Ruth to prepare herself as a bride. And Boaz, the Goel, or kinsman redeemer, marries Ruth. And that's where our study is going to pick up this morning. You see, we started out our story with three deaths, right? But the story ends with a wedding and a birth. Pretty amazing. And I've called our study this morning, it's pretty simple, God is at work. I know my titles are not very amazing, but it's, it's just the simple truth. God is at work. And it's spelled correctly. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> and, you know, again, isn't this important for us to remember? That no matter what we're going through, God is working. He cares for us. He loves us. He's never going to forsake us. I think that's important. There was this construction crew years ago. They were building a new road through a rural, rural area, knocking down trees as they progressed. And a superintendent noticed that one tree had a nest of birds who couldn't yet fly. And he marked the tree so that it wouldn't be cut down. And several weeks later, the superintendent came back to the tree. He got into a bucket truck and was lifted up so he could peer into the nest. And the fledglings were gone. They had obviously learned to fly. And the superintendent ordered the tree to cut, be cut down. And as the tree crashed to the ground, the nest fell clear, and some of the material that the birds had gathered to make the nest was scattered about. And part of it was a scrap torn from a Sunday school pamphlet. And on the scrap of paper were these words, He careth for you. Yes, even for those little birds and for us. The problem for us is that we truly believe this when everything is falling into place, right? When things are going well, when Mr. Bluebird is singing on our shoulder, right? Everything is great. Praise the Lord. And then everything is a mess. Things are not going well. Mr. Bluebird, I'm going to have to wash my shirt now. He left me a present. Here's the thing. Is God still at work? Yeah. And that's what we're going to see here in the story of Ruth. Yes, what Elimelech and his family did wasn't right, but in the end, God never gave up on Naomi, and we'll see how her life changed as she saw the hand of God working in her life once again. And again, it wasn't that God wasn't working before. He was. She just didn't see it because the circumstances blinded her of what God was doing. God wasn't out to destroy her. God was out to restore Naomi. And so I've broken these, our study into three main points, from bitterness to pleasantness in Ruth 4, verses 13 through 16, from servant to king, Ruth 4, 17, and God is at work in Ruth 4, 18 through 22. So let's pick up Ruth chapter 4, starting in verse 13, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we look at this topic, God is at work. We're told this, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a near kinsman, and may his name be famous in Israel. 
and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him, on, laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Now, weddings are special. Make no mistake about it. I remember when Julie and I got married, almost 42 years now. I know, it's hard to believe because I look so young, right? <laughs> Stop laughing. That hurts. But all the joy, right? All the people. This was an Italian wedding, so you can imagine the people. It, it was crazy. And a time of celebration. And you know how there's always the first dance with your bride. This was an Italian wedding. Can you guess what song we danced to? The theme to The Godfather, of course. <laughs> Come on, people. Now, I can't confirm or deny that. We'll just have to let it go. But, yeah, that's what we danced to. It was awesome. Now... <laughs> I know I'm weird. What can I say? But my wife knew me, and she still married me, so I guess she fits in with me. But think about that. That joy, that excitement, is it gone now? No, it better still be there, or the marriage is over, right? It's, though, different because we have grown together through those years. That joy and that excitement continues on. And I'm sure for Boaz and Ruth... Obviously, they were excited about this day, and it was a celebration for them. And in Bethlehem, weddings were huge in that part of the world. And we see this wedding, and then we see a birth. Boaz and Ruth have a child. And children were something that were very important, they, and they didn't take it for granted. They saw children as a blessing from God. And today, we, we don't see it that way, you know. We, we see it sometimes it's a, a bother, it, you know. I, I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. Hey, believe me, when we started having a family, we didn't have resources either to raise a children. If we waited till we had the money to raise children, we probably still wouldn't have any children. So, you know, that's crazy. You make it work. And again, what a blessing from God, like I said. But what I want you to see here, and really the main point of these verses is that Naomi went from bitterness to pleasantness again. She went from Mara to Naomi. And yeah, she's been through a lot through those last 10 years plus. You know, she left her home in Bethlehem, headed to Moab, from the promised land back into the world. And like I said, her husband, Elimelech, dies in Moab. Then her two sons, instead of marrying from the daughters of Israel, they marry Moabite women. And then her two sons die. I mean, that's tough. And then at the end of those ten long years, she's going to go back to the land of Israel, back to Bethlehem. But again... Listen carefully, and I went over this, but listen carefully to what she tells her daughters-in-law after they both said that they would go with her to Bethlehem. They both wanted to go at this point. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons... Would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. God did this to me. He's done this to you now because you're with me. It's not because of my sin. It's not because I've done anything wrong. But the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So Orpah Ends up, like I said, went back to Moab, but Ruth followed Naomi to Bethlehem. And again, they arrive there. The women recognize her. And she says to them, this is the amazing thing, how far from God she is at this point. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Can you imagine that? I mean, I wonder what those women, we're not told what the women thought. I mean, because that's a huge thing. Don't call me pleasantness. Call me bitterness. Can you imagine? I wonder what happened to her. Now, again, a lot has 
happened in her life. But the problem is she's blaming God for all of it. She says to these women, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. Now, again, we read some of these stories, you know, and we go, how could they do that? You know, you read the children of Israel. God brings them out of Egypt, out of slavery, brings them through the Red Sea, feeds them in the wilderness with bread and water, manna from heaven. He's doing all these things. He's delivering them. And then the children of Israel, every time the situation gets tough, they're complaining. We should have went back to Egypt. We have been better dying there. And, you know, we like the leeks and cucumbers or whatever instead of this manna from heaven. And we go, how could that happen? Naomi, how could you do that? How could you charge God? How could you say that you went out full, but you came back and lost everything? You think, where's our faith? And I think as we read that, the Lord says, you need to take a deep look in the mirror because we do that all the time. Now, let's face it. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's great to praise the Lord, right? When everything is going well. I mean, God, you're so good to me, right? I could start singing. You've always been so good to me. I'll sing it through eternity. God, you're so good. Praise the Lord. It's awesome. Look at how everything is falling into place. It's great. And then comes Mr. Bluebird. Leaves that deposit on my shoulders. Things are now falling apart. And then we go, God, how could you do that to me? I mean, I'm serving you. You know, it's not easy. I'm doing all these things for you, and this is what I get in return. It's like in the psalm with Asaph. He he said he almost stumbled. Look at how the wicked, look at what they're doing. They're writing books, they're on TV shows, they're popular. Everything happens to them. When they die, they die with a smile on their face. I don't think so, but you know when things are going bad, you exaggerate? I almost slipped. And then Asaph says, until I went in the house of the Lord. What does he mean? He says, until I got back with God and I started reading, what is going to happen to the wicked? Now, again, wicked get sick, they die just like we do. But that's the best it gets for them. This is the worst it gets for us. And we have to have that perspective. But again, we think when bad things happen to us, and they will, We live in a world full of sin. We're going to get sick. We're going to have problems. There's going to be all kinds of issues in our lives. Does that mean God doesn't love me anymore? Absolutely not. He loves you more than you will ever know. We can then start doing things like Naomi. Be very angry. Be very bitter, mad, at the world, at this person, at that person, have all kinds of of reasons why we're behaving the way we are. God, you did this to me. And we have to understand that God allows things into our lives, not to hurt us, but to help us to grow, to mature, sometimes to correct us. Do you really think our Heavenly Father, who is so wonderful, perfect, holy, righteous, is there ready just to beat on us? Absolutely not. He loves us too much. But we can let anger and bitterness get a hold of our lives, and it not only affects us, but it can affect others. It can be very destructive. Way back in the spring of 1984, or 94, excuse me, 1894, the Baltimore Orioles came to Boston to play a routine baseball game. But then what happened on the field wasn't routine at all. The Orioles' John McGraw got into a fight with the Boston third baseman. And, of course, within minutes, all the players from both teams joined in the brawl. And the warfare quickly spread to the stands. And fans were fighting amongst each other, Someone set fire to the stands. The entire ballpark burned to the ground. And the fire spread to 107 other Boston buildings as well. 
that's what anger can do. It's very destructive, bitterness. And that's with Naomi. She was angry at God for all that happened to her. She was bitter towards God, and it was seen in her lives that affected those around her. Why did she blame God for all these problems? Because she didn't recognize her sin, that she had run from God. Now, not all sickness and problems are a result of sin, but some of them are. And God will still use those things to correct us and get us back on track. And here's the other thing. This is probably the most important thing. Naomi didn't know the end of the story. Yeah. If she knew the end of the story, it'd be easy, right? But she didn't. And she, thus she didn't believe that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28. And that's for our lives as well. When things get tough, when things get difficult, we shouldn't get angry at God. We should ask God, what are you doing, Lord? What are you trying to show me? You know, as Mickey does the editing for our, our radio studies, and he was telling me this morning, you know, that as he goes through them, he gets to a point, and he'll click on it and start to listen to it, and he goes, that's just what I needed to hear. It was amazing how God knew that. Yeah, how did you click on that one spot? That's where God wanted you. So God is showing us these things as we're going through tough times. And I don't know where any of you are at, but maybe you've moved away from the house of bread. And you've gone back into the world and you're letting the world influence your life. But God is going to draw you back. Don't fight against it. That's what Naomi was doing. You move out of the world and back and to walk with the Lord, to the house of bread. And Romans 8.28 applies every single time. All things work together for good. To those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. And you think, oh, you're, you sit up there in the ivory, ivory tower. You don't know what I'm going through. Well, we don't have the time, but I can tell you all that I've been through. I'm right where you're at. We're all on the same playing field. We all have things that happen in our lives. Professor E.C. Caldwell ended his lecture, and he said, Tomorrow, and this was a class of seminary students, I will be teaching on Romans 8. So tonight, as you study, pay special attention to verse 28. Notice what this verse truly says and what it doesn't say. Then he added, One final word before I dismiss you. Whatever happens in all the years to come, remember... Romans 8.28 will always hold true. Oh, Dr. Caldwell, you're in an ivory tower. Look at you. Well, that same day, the same day he told that to his students, he and his wife were in a tragic car accident. She was killed instantly, and he was crippled permanently. That same day. Well, months later, he returned to his students and they remembered his last words. And the room was hushed as he began his lecture. You know, they're all wondering, what is he going to say now? And he said, Romans 8.28 or Romans 828 still holds true. One day we shall see God's good even in this. Wow. Not an ivory tower, but he believed it by faith. Trusting in the promises of God. Yes, Romans 8, 28, but all the other promises that God has given to us, we should apply to our lives. For Naomi, she didn't believe that. But God was slowly working in her life, and her heart was changing. And now she's seen the goodness of God and has gone from bitterness to pleasantness once again, from Mara to Naomi. You know, it is so important to have an attitude of gratitude with our Lord. And again, I don't want to downplay what anyone is going through. Not at all. But we live again in this world full of sin, of hate, of worldliness and pain. And we can develop an attitude that is not of God, but it's focused on us and what the world feels. I look at all the things that are going on in our country now, and I, I never thought it would happen this quickly, this falling away from God. I knew we were, the nation as a whole had turned from God, but I never saw the immorality ramping up like it is. But you know what? I know God's in control. 
I know he's still on the throne. And I know he's using this for his purposes. So instead of being angry and bitter, God, how could you let our nation, in, how could you allow this to happen to us? My point is, Lord, what do you want me to do during this time to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people? We could be the generation that closes out the church age. We should be the most excited people around. You know, when I was a young Christian, I always thought, man, how cool it would be to be that involved in the early church, that first generation, you know, bringing the gospel message. And the Lord showed me, hey, you could be that last generation. You should be just as excited as they were. Absolutely. Thus, we have to trust in God. We have to believe in the promises of God and walk by faith and not by sight. And I, I believe when people look at us, no matter what we're going through, they will see pleasantness instead of bitterness. Naomi, she's going to see the blessing. And, you know, I think we miss those blessings because we're so focused on all that we're going through. You have to pay attention and see what God is showing you as you're going through this time. You know, there was a, a king that had a male servant who, in all, his, in, in all circumstances, always said to him, My king, do not be discouraged because everything God does is perfect, no mistakes. Well, one day they went hunting and a wild animal attacked the king. And the servant managed to kill the animal but couldn't prevent his majesty from losing a finger. The king was furious and didn't show any gratitude. And he said, if God was good, I would not have been attacked and lost one finger. The servant replied back, you know, despite all these things, I can only tell you that God is good and everything he does is perfect. He's never wrong. Well, the king was outraged by this response, and he ordered the servant to be arrested. And while taken to prison, he told the king again, God is good and perfect. Well, another day, the king left alone for another hunt and was captured by savages who used human beings for sacrifices. And on the altar, the savages found out that the king didn't have one finger in place, and he was released because he was considered not complete to be offered to the gods. On his return to the palace, he ordered the release of his servant and said, My friend, God was really good to me. I was almost killed, but for lack of a single finger, I was let go. But I have a question. If God is so good, why did he allow me to put you in prison? The servant replied, My king, if I had not been put in prison, I would have gone with you. I would have been sacrificed because I have no missing finger. Everything God does is perfect. He's never wrong. You know, we can complain about life and the negative things that happen to us, forgetting that everything happens for a purpose. God is good and perfect. He's working. Correct perspective is so important. God is in control. He's good. And whatever he does is never wrong. Never. You know, do you ever think God is in heaven and goes, oops? No. Now, we laugh at that because it is funny. But when bad things happen, we kind of think that way. God, did you make a mistake here? No, he never does. Never. And I think when we understand that, our attitude will change. We'll have an attitude of gratitude. And we'll go from that bitterness to pleasantness. That's what Naomi did. Bitterness to pleasantness. How important that is. Understanding God is in total control. Nothing he does is without a reason, without a purpose for our lives. Look at Ruth 4, verse 17. Also, the neighbor woman gave a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. In this verse, I've called it from servant to king. Why? Why did I call it from servant to king? Because the name Obed means servant. And we are told that David is the grandson of Obed, and David became the king in Israel. What does that tell me? It tells me that all things work together for good. God has a plan, and he does things according to his will. And as much as we see a mess, God sees his plan coming to pass. And that's what we're seeing here with this child, Obed, the grandfather of David. 
from servant to the king. And it's out of this lineage that the Messiah is going to come. In fact, he starts out as a servant, doesn't he? In Mark 10, 45, we're told, for even the Son of Man did not come to serve, or to be served, excuse me, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came the first time as a servant. When is he, how is he coming again? As Almighty King, to rule and reign for a thousand years in Jerusalem. He came at first as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He's coming again as the Lion from the tribe of Judah. Wow. Now, putting the words servant and king together don't seem to fit because a king is not a servant and a servant is not a king. One rules and the other is ruled. So how does it work? Well, again, we looked at Mark 10.45, but in Luke 22, verses 24 through 27, listen to what we're told. Now, there was also a dispute among them the disciples of Jesus, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the king of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you, on the contrary. He who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves." So these are the disciples of Jesus, and they're jockeying for position. I want to be the greatest. They all thought they were Muhammad Ali or something, right? And the reason for this is they were above everyone else. And Jesus says, hey, look, I came to serve. and You're not greater than me. He said, yet I am among you as the one who serves. I wonder what they felt like. Here's Almighty God who became flesh, dwelt among us to go to the cross of Calvary. And he's saying, look, I'm here to serve and you should do no less. And then remember, when they were gathered together for the Last Supper, and none of the disciples wanted to wash any feet. Now, it's not a great job. Think about it. It's a stinky job. The roads were dirt. You walked in your sandals. Their feet must have been filthy. And so the lowest servant or slave of the house would wash the feet of the people that entered the house. And in John 13, verses 12 through 17, we're told, So when he had washed their feet, Jesus did, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for I am, so, I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Absolutely. I mean, these guys, they wanted to be the greatest. You know, pick me. They were the apostles, not the B-apostles. These were the top guys. So am I going to wash somebody's feet? Are you kidding me? And Jesus girds himself and washes their feet. And then he says, okay, you saw what I did. Now you go and do the same. Wow. Wow. When we are involved in other people's lives, it gets dirty, doesn't it? But that's what we're called to do, to love people, to reach out to them, in a sense to wash their feet. Spurgeon put it like this. He said, if there is a position in the church where the worker will have to toil and get no thanks for it, take it and be pleased with it. If you can perform a service which few will ever seek to do themselves or appreciate when performed by others, Yet occupy it with holy delight. Covet humble work, and when you get it, be content to continue in it. There is no great rush after the lowest places. You will rob no one by seeking them. Yeah, there, there's not a big push to do the lowliest of jobs. And when I say that, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek because there are no lowliest of jobs. It's called the body of Christ, and we all serve where there's a need. 
If you need to be rewarded for service, if you need to receive praise for the work, if you have to other, have others witness what you're doing, then don't do the work. I remember years ago, Pastor Chuck, he, you know, some, a woman in the church kept bringing flowers every Sunday to put up front. And after several Sundays, another woman came up to him and said, you know, Pastor Chuck, so-and-so is mad. The woman who's bringing up the flowers is mad. He said, well, well, why? Because you haven't thanked her from the pulpit for the flowers. And Pastor Chuck said, don't bring any more flowers. Who are we serving, ourselves or the Lord? Who, do we, who are we giving honor to, ourselves or the Lord? And, you know, I realized for me, being in front, yeah, it, it's hard to hide myself unless I put a sheet up, you know, and no one sees me. Or, you know, well, I guess I did speak to empty chairs when we had the lockdown, which was horrible. I mean, you guys don't laugh at my jokes too much, but no one was laughing or doing anything. So it was really bad. But again, we don't serve the Lord for our attention or praise or any of that. We serve him because we love him and we want to bless other people. Jesus came to serve. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. But he still is king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And one day he is going to sit upon the throne of David and rule and reign in the kingdom age. Revelation 19 verses 13 through 16. He, Jesus, was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah, he's Almighty God. King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, verses you know, we often use at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah is speaking of the Messiah as reigning as king and sitting upon the throne of David. And the day is getting closer. Jesus rules over all of creation. But in the incarnation, when God became flesh and dwelt among us, he laid down some of those godly attributes, not making him a lesser God, but he freely laid these down and he came to serve man, to save man from his sin, like I said. And we've seen, I mean, for Naomi, seeing the hand of God back upon her life, doesn't that encourage your life? She went from bitterness to pleasantness. When we actually see God working, it is an amazing thing. And I know for me, you know, I don't know what, it was back in 2005 or so uh, when we were kicked out of the building we were in because they needed it for um, another uh, uh, person. They wanted to rent our space as well, and we couldn't afford the increase in the rent, so we had, got kicked out. And I was really down. I was really discouraged because we put all our money into that building that we were renting to paint it and fix it up, and we didn't have any resources. Now we're kicked out, and I was down. And, you know, we had a concert in the park, and I was moping around, and, you know, Diane, sweet little Diane, uh, I was telling her, I was actually complaining to her, all that was going on. And you know Diane, with her big old smile, doesn't even think twice, and she smiles at me, and she goes, I wonder what God's going to do. And, you know, at first I'm like, just be quiet. I didn't say that. But I knew she was right. She was absolutely 100% right. I just didn't want to admit it right away because, hey, I'm the pastor. I should know better. But she was 100% correct. I wonder what God is going to do. And it changed my perspective. It actually changed my perspective since then completely because when things happen, I always think of those words. I wonder 
what God is going to do. And instead of being bitter and angry, how could they do this to me? Lord, look at what's going on. I can say, what is God going to do? And it's unpleasant. Wow. And now, this child, Obed, child of Boaz and Ruth, his name means servant. And down the road, another child's going to be born, David, the king of Israel. Can you believe this? I mean, it's incredible when you start looking at all this. And this last point, God is at work. Look at verse 18 here in Ruth chapter 4. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. And Ram begot Abinadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. So this is the genealogy leading up to Boaz, and then all the way to King David, uh, and ultimately to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, who is Perez? Well, Back in Ruth 4.11, we see the response of the people to this marriage between Boaz and Ruth. They were excited about what was taking place, and this, this is what they said. We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, first I want to deal with Rachel and Leah before we get to Perez, because from these two Wives of Jacob were born eight out of the 12 sons who made up the tribes of Israel. And it speaks of them prospering in Ephrathah or Bethlehem. Do we see it? Yeah. King David was born in this little town called Bethlehem in Judah. But not King David. There's another king who's born there, and his name is Jesus. And we see it in Micah 5 2, a prophecy of where this child, the Messiah, is to be born. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. From a little hick town, just a few thousand people, not many people living there. Bethlehem in Judah, not the other Bethlehem, but the one in Judah. The Messiah was to be born, and this would be God who is going to be born. How do I know that? Because that phrase, uh, from of old, from everlasting. From everlasting means from beyond the vanishing point. In other words, he's eternal. No matter how far back you go, this child who is going to be born in Bethlehem is God because he is eternal. Wow. But here's the problem. Because they also said, may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. In Genesis chapter 38, we see Judah arrange the marriage of his son Ur to Tamar. But he dies, and he doesn't have any children, so his brother marries Tamar to raise up a child to be a kinsman for his dead brother. But he gets second thoughts, he refuses to raise up the child, and the Lord takes his life as well. So Judah has another son, and at this point, he's a little nervous, you know, First son marries Tamar, he dies. The second son marries Tamar, raising up a child for his brother, he dies. Why do I want to give my last son to this woman? This isn't going to be good. So he basically says, no, go home to your father, and she does. Well, Tamar pretends to be a prostitute, and she has relations with Judah, and he didn't know it was his daughter-in-law. They wore the veils, and after some time, news spread very quickly that Tamar was pregnant. And you know Judah, righteous Judah. She needs to be put to death. Bring her here. She needs to die. Tamar says, well, the father is the one who owns this signet ring and this staff. Oh, that's mine. <laughs> I guess we won't kill you, huh? It wasn't as righteous as he thought. The son of Judah and Tamar was Perez. And he became part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And the blessing given here in Ruth is that her home may be like the home of Perez. 
That's kind of a strange blessing when you think about it. But again, out of the lineage, the Messiah would come. But here's a problem. And you really can't ignore it. In Deuteronomy 23.2, this is what we're told. One of illegitimate birth shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the congregation of the Lord. So Perez was the illegitimate son of Judah and Tamar. And none of his descendants could enter the house of the Lord until the 10th generation. So how can we reconcile this? God is amazing. If you count from Perez to David, 10th generation. So he had the right to be on the throne. What a lucky break. No luck in that at all. It's timing. And God's perfect timing. And Boaz and Ruth are the great-grandparents of David, the king of Israel. What's my point? God is at work. And they didn't know any of this. But God was still at work. And when we get to, you know, in Matthew chapter 1, we get the genealogy all the way from Abraham all the way to Jesus. Jesus and Boaz and Ruth are mentioned in it. Both of them. And I don't know why, but I'm always amazed at the way that God works. And I think that's probably a good thing. You know, we shouldn't just take it for granted. We should be amazed. And I am. I, I, it's, he just blows me away. One writer put it like this. He said, God's hand is all over history. God works out his purpose generation after generation, limited as we are to one lifetime. Each of us see so little of what happens. A genealogy is a striking way of bringing before us the continuity of God's purpose through the ages. The process of history is not haphazard. There is a purpose in it all, and the purpose is the purpose of God. Absolutely. You know, I think we would be at peace more often if we understood that God knows what he's doing. He's at work, even though I may you know, not see it with my eyes, even though I may not understand what's going on. You know, years ago when uh, my kids were younger, we went up north snowmobiling, and you know, I let my oldest son drive. But before he did that, he was riding in back, having to hold on. I couldn't remember if he was holding on when I was driving or my wife was driving, but it doesn't matter. But he was screaming. He was terrified. He was like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. And then, why did he feel that way? Because he wasn't in control. And then we let him drive. And I was back there going, oh my God, we're going to die. <laughs> you know how it goes. But God is at work. You know, we don't have to go, oh my gosh, we're going to die. Oh my gosh, I wonder what God is going to do. Because God is at work. And we've spent many months going through the book of Ruth. And I, I pray that you've been blessed as we've gone through this book because it's a really beautiful story that took place in a very dark period in Israel's history, the time of the judges. And the thrust of the story here in Ruth is redemption, set free by paying a price. Boaz was able to do that as he played the role of the kinsman redeemer, the Goel, as he took Ruth as his bride and purchased the land back that was lost. And we saw how this is a picture of our kinsman redeemer, our Goel, Jesus Christ. God became a man in the incarnation. He couldn't send an angel to do this work because the angel couldn't be our kinsman. He couldn't send a prophet or priest. They had their own sins. But for Jesus, he added humanity to his deity to be our kinsman. And God from eternity, planned to bring Ruth and Boaz together and thus make Bethlehem his entrance point for the coming of Jesus as our true kinsman redeemer, fully God, fully man. He paid the price for our redemption on the cross of Calvary. He purchased us to himself, a bride. And think about this. Ruth was a Gentile bride for Boaz, right? We are a Gentile bride for Christ. He's purchased us back, and one day there's going to be the marriage with our bridegroom, and then Jesus is going to return and take back that which was taken from him, this earth. It was given to Satan when Adam sinned, but he purchased it back, 
And when he returns, he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Righteousness will fill this land. I can't wait. But the Bible is a story of redemption. From Genesis 3.15 through Revelation 22.21, paradise lost in in Genesis is paradise gained in Revelation. And the thrust of the word of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the book is about, God's love story to us. And I'm going to close with this story because it shows that God is always at work even during some of the darkest times, even when we don't see it. And the thing is, don't be bitter, but be pleasant knowing that God is at work. This is the story. It's a tough one. One man's life provides a dramatic answer to the question, can God indeed bring positives out of troubled times? This young man's name is David, and he is an awesome picture of God using difficulties for good. For years, he viewed trials as something that affected only his external world, and any blow to what he owed, owned or how he looked would discourage him and leave him feeling cheated. Today, David travels around the world taking with people or talking with people about how he discovered that no matter what happens to the outside, it's the internal life that trials really touch. The bigger the trial, the more potential to see God's power and peace at work in the inner person. During the Vietnam War, David went through rigorous training to become part of the ultra-elite Special Forces team the Navy used on dangerous search-and-destroy missions. During a nighttime raid on an enemy stronghold, David experienced the greatest trial of his life. When he and his men were pinned down by enemy machine gun fire, he pulled a, a phosphorus grenade from his belt and stood up to throw it. But as he pulled back his arm, a bullet hit the grenade and exploded next to his ear. Lying on his side on the bank of a muddy river, he watched part of his face float by. His entire face and shoulder alternately smoldered and caught on fire as the phosphorus uh, that had embedded itself in his body came into contact with the air. David knew he was going to die, yet miraculously he didn't. He was pulled from the water by his fellow soldiers, flown directly to Saigon, and then taken to a waiting plane bound for Hawaii. But David's problems were just beginning. When he first went into surgery, the first of what would become dozens of operations, the surgical team had a major problem during the operation. As they cut away tissue that had been burned or torn by the grenade, the phosphorus would hit the oxygen in the operating room to begin to ignite again. Several times the doctors and nurses ran out of the room, leaving him alone because they were afraid the oxygen oxygen used in surgery would explode. Incredibly, David survived the operation and was taken to a ward that held the most severe burn and injury cases from the war. Lying on his bed, his head the size of a basketball, David knew he presented a grotesque picture. Although he had once been a handsome man, he knew he had nothing to offer his wife or anyone else because of his appearance. He felt more alone and more worthless than he had ever felt in his life. But David wasn't alone in his room. There was another man who had been wounded in Vietnam and was also a nightmarish sight. He had lost an arm and a leg, and his face was badly torn and scarred. As David was recovering from surgery, this man's wife arrived from the States. When she walked into the room and took one look at her husband, she became nauseated. She took off her wedding ring, put it on the nightstand next to him, and said, I'm so sorry, but there's no way I could live with you looking like that. And with that, she walked out the door. He could barely make any sounds through his torn throat and mouth, but the soldier wept and shook for hours. Two days later, he died. That woman's attitude represents, in many respects, the way the world views a victim of accident or injury. If a child emotionally or physically scars someone or causes him to lose his attractiveness, the world says, ugly is bad. And consequently, any value the person feels he has to others is drained away. For this poor wounded soldier, knowing that his wife saw no value in him was more terrible than the wounds he suffered. He blew away his last hope that someone, somewhere, could find worth in him because he knew how the world would perceive him. Three days later, David's wife arrived. After watching what happened with the other soldier, he had no idea what kind of reaction she would have toward him, and he dreaded her coming. His wife, a strong Christian, took one look at him, came over, 
and kissed him on the only place on his face that wasn't bandaged. In a gentle voice, she said, Honey, I love you. I always love you. I want you to know that whatever it takes, whatever the odds, we can make it together. She hugged him where she could to avoid disturbing his injuries and stayed with him for the next several days. Watching what happened with the other man's wife and seeing his own wife's love for him gave David tremendous strength. More than that, her understanding and accept, accepting him greatly reinforced his own relationship with the Lord. In the weeks and months that followed, David's wounds slowly but steadily healed. It took dozens of operations and months of agonizing recovery, but today, miraculously, David can see and hear. On national television, when David, we heard David make an incredible statement. I am twice the person I was before I went to Vietnam. For one thing, God has used my suffering to help me feel other people's pain and to have an incredible burden to reach people for him. The Lord has let me have a worldwide positive effect on people's lives because of what I went through. I wouldn't trade anything I've gone through for the benefits my trials have had on my life my family's life, and on the countless teenagers and adults I've had the opportunity to influence over the years. David experienced a trial that no parents would wish on their children. Yet in spite of all the tragedy that surrounded him, God turned his troubled times into fruitful ones. Wow. Never give up. God's at work, guys. You know, it's so easy to lose sight of that when difficulties come our way. How could God use me now? You know, I felt that way when I first got diabetes, before I even came up here. Because I knew what God had called me to do. He called me to come to Wisconsin to be a pastor. Now I got diabetes. How am I going to do this? And it was tough. God, what are you doing? I don't understand this. How could I do this now with the diabetes? And as I sat in that hospital room up on the upper floors in a physical therapy room at night no one else was around I was just crying out to the Lord Lord I don't get this why did why is this happening to me and there's a huge storm raging storm lightning thunder pouring rain beating against the windows and the Lord in a very still soft voice said my grace is sufficient and that was it that's all he said and now I can move on now I can go forward because God's at work. He didn't give up on me. He didn't say, well, you know, I made a mistake. He doesn't make mistakes, guys. He's an awesome, awesome God. And no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, God is going to use you because he's always at work. And I pray that we can minister to others that are going through really difficult times to encourage them. Don't give up. God's at work. I know it's hard now. I know you don't see a way out of this, that this is going to be something that's going to be in your life forever until you go home to be with the Lord. But he's at work, so don't give up. Keep your eyes on him. Don't become bitter. Be pleasant. Have an attitude of gratitude and serve him no matter where you're at. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this journey through the book of Ruth and in the lives of these people real people that had difficult times, that maybe didn't do everything that you wanted them to do, but yet you were still at work in their lives. And what an encouragement for us. Thank you, Lord, for being patient. Thank you for continually working, never giving up, never forsaking us, but always working in our lives. And Lord, I just pray, may we glorify you in all that we do. We love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you for this wonderful story. And thank you for showing us the lineage of Jesus through David, a wonderful story of a kinsman and our kinsman, Jesus Christ. Again, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.